Of course, we're all familiar with fake news, but one term that we should popularize just as much is Operation Mockingbird, and it's something I covered in detail on my channel years ago, but it's been quite a long time, and it's such an important and serious topic that I'm going to do a very lengthy presentation on it by reading from my book, The True Story of Fake News, which came out at the end of 2017, because it's up to us to educate the American people about how the media functions and how it's colluding with the deep state to try to overthrow the Trump administration. A lot of people enjoyed the reading last week from the Liberal Media Industrial Complex, and so I think I'll make it a weekly series, if that's what you guys want, and Operation Mockingbird really is one of the most important topics when it comes to media period. No discussion about fake news would be complete without a thorough examination of the CIA's Operation Mockingbird, which at first sounds like a conspiracy theory out of the plot of a Hollywood thriller, but it is a very real and well-documented program that was exposed during a 1975 congressional hearing called the Church Committee. In the early 1970s, there were widespread allegations that the CIA was involved in a variety of corrupt activities, including spying on American citizens and even assassinating foreign leaders. The Church Committee was set up to investigate these reports, and one of the surprising things they uncovered was that the CIA had been covertly spending millions of dollars a year to pay key figures at major news outlets to work as government propagandists and gatekeepers. The scope of Operation Mockingbird is staggering. Thomas Braden, who helped lead the program, admitted, quote, if the director of the CIA wanted to extend a present, say, to somebody, suppose he just thought this man could use $50,000, that's $250,000 adjusted for inflation today, by the way, he's working well and doing his job, he could just hand it to him and never have to account to anybody. There was simply no limit to the money it could spend, and no limit to the people it could hire, and no limit to the activities it could decide were necessary. Such reporters could be considered to be members of the deep state, using their position of influence to serve intelligence agencies rather than the news agency or their readers. These were people who would be given classified information to leak to the public, a practice that still goes on today, which we saw in the case of the transcripts of President Trump's phone calls and those of his advisors being given to the press after they were intercepted, which is obviously a serious felony. During the initial investigation into Operation Mockingbird, a congressman asked William Colby, who was then the head of the CIA, Do you have any people paid by the CIA? who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. Executive session meaning a closed session with only a handful of senators who were authorized to have access to classified information. Despite the CIA's attempt to contain the details and scope of the program, a lot of information was revealed, but many investigators believe that the full extent of Operation Mockingbird was never made public and insist the church committee's hearings were just a limited hangout, meaning despite some damaging revelations, the true nature and scope of the program remained classified. Former special assistant to the deputy director of the CIA, Victor Marchetti, said that limited hangouts are used by the CIA, quote, when their veil of secrecy is shredded and they can no longer rely on a phony cover story to misinform the public, so they resort to admitting, sometimes even volunteering, some of the truth while still managing to withhold the key and damaging facts in the case. The public, however, is usually so intrigued by the new information that it never thinks to pursue the matter further. Frank Weiser, who led the Office of Strategic Services, which would later become the CIA, called Operation Mockingbird the Mighty Wurlitzer, after the Wurlitzer jukebox, because he and his operatives could get the media to play any tune that they wanted. The church committee also uncovered assassination plots, a frozen poison dart gun built by the CIA for such operations, poison pen letters, and other shocking activities, which was actually their primary objective. Discovering the CIA's media manipulation was an unexpected side effect. The Church Committee's final report on the investigation admits, quote, the Central Intelligence Agency has used the U.S. media for both the collection of intelligence and for cover, and that the CIA maintained covert relationships with about 50 American journalists or employees of U.S. media organizations. 
They are just a part of the network of several hundred foreign individuals around the world who provide intelligence for the CIA and at times attempt to influence opinion through the use of covert propaganda. These individuals provide the CIA with direct access to a large number of foreign newspapers, periodicals, scores of press services and news agencies, radio and television stations, commercial book publishers, and other foreign media outlets, end quote. Notice they stressed foreign outlets, which was just a diversion. The program was very much a domestic operation as well. Shortly after Operation Mockingbird was exposed, George Bush Sr., then director of the CIA, issued a statement saying, quote, the CIA will not enter into a paid or contractual relationship with any full-time or part-time news correspondent accredited by any United States news service, newspaper, periodical, radio, or television station <laughs> anymore. The CIA also claimed, quote, As soon as feasibly possible, the agency will bring existing relationships with individuals in these groups into conformity with this new policy. CIA recognizes that members of these groups, U.S. media and religious personnel, may wish to provide information to the CIA on matters of intelligence uh, of interest to the United States government. The CIA will continue to welcome information volunteered by such individuals, end quote. The Church Committee report noted that, quote, of the approximately 50 U.S. journalists or personnel of U.S. media organizations who were employed by the CIA or maintained some other covert relationship with the CIA at the time of the announcement, fewer than one half will be terminated under the new CIA guidelines. It goes on to say, quote, about half of these some 50 CIA relationships with the U.S. media were paid relationships, ranging from salaried operatives working under journalists to cover to U.S. journalists serving as independent contractors for the CIA and being paid regularly for their services to those who receive only occasional gifts and reimbursements from the CIA. More than a dozen United States news organizations and commercial publishing houses formally provided cover for CIA agents. A few of these organizations were unaware that they provided this cover, end quote. The report also admits, quote, while the CIA did not provide the names of its media agents or the names of the media organizations which with they were connected, the committee reviewed summaries of their relationships and work for the CIA. During the church hearings, the CIA claimed that they never tried to engage in any clandestine use of staff employees of U.S. publications which have a substantial impact or influence on public opinion. But this is an obvious lie, and the report whitewashed such actions as fallout, which they described as unintended and incidental side effects of their propaganda, which they admitted spread through the U.S. media, not just the foreign press. They said this fallout in the United States was, quote, inevitable and consequently permissible, and there were no way to shield the American people from such fallout, end quote. A former senior official of the agency said in his testimony, quote, if you plant an article in some paper overseas and it is a hard-hitting article or revelation, there's no way of guaranteeing that it's not going to get picked up and published by the Associated Press in this country. The report also admitted, quote, the domestic fallout of the covert propaganda comes from many sources, books intended primarily for an English-speaking foreign audience, press placements that are picked up by the international wire services, press services controlled by the CIA, and direct funding of foreign institutions that attempt to propagandize the United States public and Congress. Even if they aren't officially paying reporters anymore, which is most likely a complete lie, the fact is that they openly invited reporters and executives to work with the CIA voluntarily, and the report admits that this relationship would be of great benefit to the careers of the journalists who take them up on that offer. The report also admitted that the CIA propaganda contaminating U.S. media, fallout as it's called, quote, occurs in virtually any instance of propaganda use, and that it is truly impossible to insulate the United States from propaganda fallout. 
It goes on to say, quote, the fallout problem is probably most serious when the U.S. public is dependent on the polluted media channel for its information on a particular subject. They even admitted that, quote, the propaganda effort had an impact on the American public and congressional opinion, end quote. One example was the CIA paying $170,000 to create pro-Vietnam War propaganda magazines in the 1970s, which were then distributed to American readers, including the offices of United States congressmen and senators. The CIA-funded magazine, which wasn't named, even sponsored American congressmen to travel to Vietnam. The Church Report admits that, quote, through this institution, the CIA engaged in propagandizing the American public, including its Congress, on the controversial issue of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. The report even noted, quote, the CIA recognizes that it risks seriously misleading U.S. policymakers, end quote, and that their propaganda might influence the thinking of senior U.S. officials or affect U.S. intelligence estimates, end quote, and no mechanism exists to protect the U.S. public and the Congress from the fallout of black propaganda or any other propaganda. The CIA also secretly ran various newspapers in foreign countries to take their propaganda to a whole new level and provide cover for CIA operatives. One paper was The Daily American in Rome, which was used by the agency to help influence Italy's electorate. Operation Mockingbird also funded the publishing of various books, although they refused to mention which ones. Former CBS president Sid Mickelson was later asked if he thought, despite these revelations, the CIA was still covertly working with reporters, and he answered, quote, Yeah, I would think probably. For a reporter, it would probably continue today. But because of all the revelations of the period in the 1970s, it seems to me a reporter has to be a lot more circumspect when doing it now, or he runs the risk of at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be more careful about it. It's interesting to point out that CNN's Anderson Cooper interned for the CIA during the summer after his sophomore year of college, and again the following summer, while he was attending Yale University, a hotbed of the CIA. Radar Online reported in 2006 that, quote, Anderson Cooper has long traded on his biography, carving a niche for himself as the most human of news anchors, but there's one aspect of his past that the silver-headed CNN star has never made public, the months he spent training for a career with the Central Intelligence Agency. Cooper then confirmed his connections with the CIA in a blog post on CNN's website and said he decided not to talk about it publicly until Radar contacted CNN, telling them they were going to publish their story and were looking for a comment. By the way, my books are not available in stores. You can only get the paperback from Amazon.com or download the ebook from any of the major ebook stores. Because I'm the self publisher, and even though I submitted copies for review to the Barnes and Noble stock department or whatever it's called, they just decided that they weren't good enough to stock on the shelves. Carl Bernstein, who worked for the Washington Post, and he blew the lid off the Watergate scandal, which led to the resignation of President Nixon in 1974, became an instant icon in the news business and gained a reputation for his continued investigations into government corruption and abuse of power. A few years after his Watergate bombshell, he left the Washington Post and for six months investigated the CIA's relationship with the press, leading to a cover story in Rolling Stone. While the church committee was reluctant to name names and news agencies, he certainly wasn't. He named some of the papers and reporters who had cooperated with Operation Mockingbird, including people at the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, the New York Herald Tribune, the Associated Press, and even his former employer, the Washington Post. Although he did defend the paper, saying the publisher, Catherine Graham at the time, and managing editors, were unaware of the operation and claimed only stringers were involved. Was he protecting his former employer or treating the investigation into them with kid gloves? While that's likely the case, it's also possible that he was just in denial about their involvement, but his Rolling Stone story was still packed with information not mentioned at all during the church hearing. Bernstein wrote, quote, Journalists provided a full range of clandestine services, from simple intelligence gathering to serving as go-betweens with spies in communist countries. Reporters shared their notebooks with the CIA. Editors shared their staffs. 
CIA documents show journalists were engaged to perform tasks for the CIA with the consent of the managements of America's leading news organizations. He pointed out that part of the operation included using journalists to, quote, aid in the recruitment and handling of foreign nationals who are channels of secret information reaching American intelligence. He continued, quote, many journalists were used by the CIA to assist in this process, and they had the reputation of being among the best in the business. The peculiar nature of the job of a foreign correspondent is ideal for such work. He is accustomed to unusual access by his host country, permitted to travel in areas often off limits to other Americans, spends much of his time cultivating sources in governments, academic institutions, the military establishments, and scientific communities. He has the opportunity to form long-term personal relationships with sources and, perhaps more than any other category of American operative, is in a position to make correct judgments about the susceptibility and availability of foreign nationals for recruitments as spies. He goes on, quote, the tasks they performed sometimes consisted of little more than serving as eyes and ears for the CIA, reporting on what they had seen or overheard in an Eastern European factory. On other occasions, their assignments were more complex, planting subtly concocted pieces of misinformation, hosting parties or receptions designed to bring together American agents and foreign spies, serving up black propaganda to leading foreign journalists at lunch or dinner, providing their hotel rooms or bureau offices as drops for highly sensitive information moving to and from foreign agents, conveying instructions and dollars to the CIA-controlled members of foreign governments. Do you understand what he just said there? International correspondents are literally used to give cash bribes to foreign officials. Bernstein even explained how unsuspecting journalists were recruited for the program. Quote, Often the CIA's relationship with a journalist might begin informally with a lunch, a drink, a casual exchange of information. An agency official might then offer a favor. For example, a trip to a country difficult to reach. In return, he would seek nothing more than the opportunity to debrief the reporter afterwards. A few more lunches, a few more favors, and only then might there be a mention of a formal arrangement. That came later, said a CIA official, after you had the journalist on a string. Could this explain how the Washington Post and the New York Times keep getting classified information leaked to them in order to damage the Trump administration? Are they willing servants of the deep state trying to bring down the president by any means necessary? Senator Chuck Schumer once gave an ominous warning to President Trump when he said that the intelligence agencies have six ways from Sunday to get back at you if they don't like what you're doing. Bernstein quotes one CIA official as admitting, in return for our giving them information, We'd ask them to do things that fit their roles as journalists, but that they wouldn't have thought of unless we put it in their minds. This was all informal and unofficial. The formal recruitment of reporters, Bernstein says, only occurred after they had been vetted with background checks to ensure they could be trusted as, quote, agents of the government. Journalists being considered had to sign non-disclosure agreements before the offer was even made. And Bernstein quotes an unnamed former assistant to the CIA director as saying, quote, The secrecy agreement was the sort of ritual that got you into the tabernacle, end quote. David Atlee Phillips, a former CIA chief operations officer himself, admitted that more than 200 journalists had signed non-disclosure agreements with the CIA, which Bernstein described as making up a good old boy network that constituted something of an establishment elite in the media, politics, and academia, who wrote, quote, propaganda for CIA proprietary publications. Once uncovered by the church committee, the CIA tried to paint Operation Mockingbird as something that only functioned to influence foreign press. But Carl Bernstein admits, quote, the CIA's use of the American news media has been much more extensive than agency officials have acknowledged publicly or in closed sessions with members of Congress. He goes so far as to say, quote, the use of journalists has been among the most productive means of intelligence gathering employed by the CIA. 
CIA Director William Colby admitted during the church hearing that people in management were involved, not just reporters, and they helped the CIA with the program. And while Colby wouldn't name names, Carl Bernstein pointed to William Paley, who was the president of CBS, Henry Luce, the founder of Time Magazine, and Arthur Hayes Slusberger, the publisher of the New York Times, who actually admitted the CIA had him sign a non-disclosure agreement. At least 10 employees at the New York Times were working as CIA assets or were actually CIA agents who the paper were providing cover for, often in their foreign press bureau. The CIA even had a training program in the 1950s which taught agents how to pretend to be journalists and were sometimes placed in major news organizations with help from management. It wasn't just newspapers, of course. The big three television networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC at the time, were involved as well. CBS provided journalistic cover for CIA employees and allowed their newsrooms to be monitored by the CIA. Bernstein says that in the 1950s and 60s, CBS officials even met for an annual dinner with the CIA. Sid Mickelson later admitted that when he became the president of CBS, quote, I was told by Paley, the CIA director, that there was an ongoing relationship with the CIA. He introduced me to two agents who he said would keep in touch. We all discussed the Goodrich situation, one of the undercover agents, and film arrangements. I assumed this was a normal relationship at the time. This was at the height of the Cold War, and I assume the communications media were cooperating, though the Goodrich, Goodrich matter was compromising. High-level CIA officials worked with, quote, top management of the news agencies to give agents working undercover as journalists assignments in foreign countries, according to Bernstein, and the CIA had some of the best-known correspondents in the business as operatives using TV networks for journalistic cover. He also noted that a reporter is the perfect cover for a CIA operative because it's a reporter's job to ask questions, investigate things, and travel around the world to do so. Colby admitted that the agency had, quote, some three dozen American reporters, editors, or executives on the CIA payroll, including five who worked for the General Circulation News Organizations. William Bader, who supervised the Senate Committee's investigation, admitted that there were CIA officers at management levels in major media companies. Malcolm Muir, Newsweek's former editor, said, quote, Whenever I heard something that I thought might be of interest to Alan Dulles, I'd call him up. At one point, he appointed one of his CIA men to keep in regular contact with our reporters. During the church hearings, then-CIA Director William Colby tried to claim they weren't doing any of this anymore and downplayed the program, saying it didn't work as well as they had hoped. But he was just whitewashing its effectiveness, and many said that even the church hearing itself was part of the cover-up. For example, they didn't even question any of the journalists or executives who were working for the CIA. Why wouldn't they want to get major media executives and reporters on the witness stand to testify under oath about what they were doing? This should have been a key part of the investigation, but it wasn't. Why? Because they didn't want to dig that deep. They didn't want the extent of the program and who was involved to be known. The committee was compromised and limited their investigation to prevent the magnitude of what was happening from being made public. Carl Bernstein wrote that the CIA were able to convince key members of the committee that full inquiry or even limited public disclosure of the dimensions of the activity would do irreparable damage to the nation's intelligence gathering apparatus as well as to the reputations of hundreds of individuals. At the time of the Senate investigation, George Bush Sr. was the director of the CIA and pressured members of the committee and successfully persuaded them to essentially whitewash the investigation. The CIA refused to turn over documents about which journalists were working for them and only gave the committee rewritten summaries of documents, all of which had the names of journalists and media executives removed. Most of the documents they did turn over were about foreign journalists on foreign soil, giving the false impression that such a thing wasn't happening in America. Speaking of the church committee's final report, Senator Gary Hart said, quote, 
It hardly reflects what we found. There was a prolonged and elaborate negotiation with the CIA over what would be said. In other words, it was a whitewash. Just another limited hangout with some damning information, but as usual, the full truth would remain hidden. Most people are completely unaware of the church committee today, and if they were told about Operation Mockingbird, would just think it's a conspiracy theory. But as one unnamed senator quoted in Carl Bernstein's Rolling Stone story says, From the CIA point of view, this was the highest, most sensitive, covert program of all. It was a much larger part of the operational system than has been indicated. See what I mean? See why I've been telling you that my videos are just the tip of the iceberg? So if you want to learn more, obviously go to Amazon.com and get the book, or you can go to any of the ebook stores and download them onto your tablet or your e-reader. I'm not going to record like a whole audiobook, but maybe for the next few weeks I'll read a new chapter because, quite frankly, I'm tired of talking about the coronavirus, and there's a lot of serious issues that I can't cover in a short and sarcastic, you know, five or seven minute video. And by the way, any resemblance to Jim Acosta on the cover of the True Story of Fake News is merely coincidental and unintentional. Редактор субтитров А.Семкин Корректор А.Егорова